Before we start, just letting you guys know that I have a Twitch page where I stream 3 to 4 days a week. The link is in the video description and top comment. Thanks everyone. It seemed like every time Polyphony Digital released a video game on any PlayStation console, they were on top of the gaming world. Their Gran Turismo titles were among the best selling each passing generation, and by the mid-2000s with the release of the PlayStation Portable, Polyphony had a productive stretch awaiting, and it was more than just Gran Turismo 5. The first official announcement of a PSP spin-off was E3 2004 under the working title Gran Turismo 4 Mobile. It was meant to be, well, Gran Turismo 4, exactly the same as its PS2 counterpart, circuits, cars, events, etc. And looking back, that honestly would have made it a top 3 greatest PSP title if such a thing existed. One of the key features they also wanted to sell was the social aspect of being able to trade cars from your garage and link multiple PSPs together for co-op multiplayer. I know saying that out loud, it requires multiple PSPs all with their own copy of GT4 Mobile, which sounds like an expensive activity, but even today, there are plenty of PlayStation consoles in people's households with the Gran Turismo game in its collection, so it wasn't a far-fetched idea. But at E3 2005, it was never mentioned. Then it was delayed to 2006, and Tourist Trophy and Gran Turismo HD were released, although Kazunori Yamauchi mentioned with GT5 that he considered connectivity between the PS3 and PSP, hinting that GT4 Mobile was still in development. And yet, time passed, and still no game. It didn't help that Gran Turismo 5 was also delayed beyond belief, which as Ape Simpson would say, was the style at the time. Kaz explained the delays were simply because they were too busy working on other titles, including Gran Turismo 4, 5, and Tourist Trophy, and and he refused to outsource the project to another developer, calling the idea unthinkable. As well as dealing with programming the game for two different PSP models because of the difference in button placement. Eventually in 2009, when Sony announced that second model, the PSP Go, they confirmed titles for other iconic franchises including Metal Gear and Gran Turismo, in a release date of October 2009, which they met to coincide with the aforementioned PSP Go. Surprised Sony didn't call it Gran Turismo PSP, like, I don't know, Nintendo do with their Mario titles, for example. Just makes it harder to know what you're talking about when you mention these games, unless they're clearly a remake. So to avoid confusion for this review, I will call this game Gran Turismo PSP, or the PSP version. I only knew a few people who owned a PlayStation Portable, and only one, to my knowledge, had Gran Turismo PSP in their collection. I've obviously never had this game, despite my history with the series, solely because I've never owned a portable console until October 2018, when I got a second-hand PlayStation Vita. And like the GTA Chinatown Wars review, I wrote around 70% of the script for this video on a holiday because that's how much I like reviewing video games, ladies and gentlemen. I'm willing to keep doing it even when I'm supposed to be on holidays. Besides, it's good to experience this game by actually playing it on the go, and most importantly, it's been one of my biggest requests for literally years now. I've also spent the last couple of years re-reviewing the Gran Turismo series, updating the older videos I made when the subscription count can be measured in double digits at the time, and recently discovered how to capture a portable gameplay thanks to the PlayStation TV so I can capture Gran Turismo PSP since I was able to buy it off the PlayStation Store before it was delisted. So thanks again Lance McDonald for letting me borrow your PS TV so I can review this game. I'll give this back soon, I promise. Ready? It has the same kind of presentation you'd expect from any Gran Turismo title. It looks like a cross between the 4th and 5th, obviously, with the menu set up and the track and car list. However, the first thing you're going to notice is a lack of a dedicated Gran Turismo mode, which back in 2009 disappointed a lot of fans. Instead, you start with a rather generous 100,000 credits and a Renault Megane, a not fast car, basically. The car you start with supposedly randomizes between what you see and when I played this in 2019, I got a Pontiac Vibe. 5 GT for a first car. Not exactly setting a good first impression, no offense to anyone watching this and actually owns one of these cars. So if there's no Gran Turismo mode, how do you earn credits and build up your garage? Well, you win races, but the way you do is entirely in your hands. You set the races up yourself, like arcade mode, circuit, direction, the number of laps, and vehicle of choice. The more laps you add, the more credits you earn based on the position you place, and whenever you win on a particular circuit, it will unlock another difficulty option to earn more credits, and as you can tell from the circuit list, it's all over the place. And yes, the longer the track, the more you earn per lap. I have to say, for a portable game, the circuit count took me by surprise. Like, how did they fit 45 onto one universe? 
universal media disc, including the full Nurburgring. How is this game only one gigabyte? Sure, not every single circuit from Gran Turismo 4 is here, like Special Stage Route 5, where's that? And a few of these are short and variations, but even putting that into consideration, there are still 34 different environments. And if you find a way to hack the game's code, you also get Smoky Mountain and Hong Kong. Why they couldn't just put it in this game officially, I don't get. Unfortunately, because you're forced to select the lowest difficulty at the start, you clear one difficulty letter, the hardest letter available illustrated in this track selection, it makes the races way too easy. Like so many easy ones, I mean look at the gap between me and the opponents. Hard to tell because of the small screen. There you go. And there are no random cars to select, like a traditional arcade mode. You can only use what you have in your garage and you only start with one. I honestly pity anyone that starts a new game with a Pontiac Vibe GT, so even though you're technically not repeating the same event over and over again like most older Gran Turismo titles, you still get that sense of repetitiveness and when your garage eventually has a dozen supercars inside, there's never a sense of progression that you're building a motorsport career. To summarize, a dedicated Gran Turismo mode is better than what we have here. The closest thing you get to that are these driving challenges disguised as license tests. You just had to put them in there, didn't you Polyphony Digital? You couldn't put designated race events, but you could put in these. Well, unlike the main series, they're not mandatory, and you actually earn series credits since, say you get a gold trophy, you earn the credits from bronze, silver, as well as gold, so you can find yourself earning hundreds of thousands of credits for essentially getting a gold trophy on a license test. And that might be enough to motivate the player to keep trying considering how much you earn from single races by comparison. You could say they're a combination between the tests and driving missions and because it's a portable game the controls are more simplistic which I'll get to. So metal targets are more forgiving than usual. And no you can't repeat the same challenges for credit farming. These can also be a handy way to judge which cars are good to drive without costing you a single credit. Like I wouldn't have bought a Lotus Elise for example if it weren't for these challenges where I got the gold pretty easily. And also a faster way to get to the car you want, not because of the credits you earn but speeding up the timeline because the way you buy cars is pretty idiotic. Instead of having a giant map where everything is free to look at, here only 4 dealerships are present at one time, even then not all the models from that dealership are available and they randomize every 2 days in game, not real life to be precise. Because there's no Gran Turismo mode, GT PSP focuses mostly on the car collecting aspect, kind of like the Forza Motorsport series and encourages you to think less about which car to buy because the prize money is easier to come by. But presuming there's a car you really want, finally appears, unfortunately you can't afford it and because dealerships randomize every two days, your only option is to win a race with a lot of laps which is a real grind if your fastest car is a Renault Megane, or otherwise you're just waiting another 2 million days just to have another chance of getting exactly what you want. And this is also assuming you're checking the showroom every single time you complete a race. Apparently the order of dealerships is a cycle that lasts 70 days, so after that the brands that appeared at the beginning go back to square one. I started to notice this after day 100 with the cars available being identical from before. Keep in mind there are 833 cars in this game, which is more than GT4 including Ferrari, Lamborghini and Bugatti making their debut to the series. Again, you can question whether the number is inflated given the different Skyline GTRs and Toyota Supras available. I even found two Dodge Viper race cars, one with the PlayStation sponsorship and one that doesn't. Sure. Still, 833, that is an insane number of cars for any video game. And again, how is this game just over a thousand megabytes? However, this random dealership system clearly doesn't work if I find myself deliberately entering and exiting races just to get what I wanted. I mean, my personal goal was to buy a Ford performance vehicle just so I can convince my father to play this game. Those are his favorite cars. I recommend looking up a full list on the internet, create your own little wish list, and hope you can afford them when the opportunity arises. However, when you're on the track driving these cars, well, that's a different story. Ready? Start! 
The only game in the GT series that does that, ready, start. For technical reasons, presumably because of the frame rate, there are only four races at once. There's no damage model apart from pixelated sparks, and the music loops endlessly in a race like Gran Turismo 2, so if you selected a huge number of laps, you will hate that. Fortunately, if you complete the first three letters of the driving challenges, you unlock the option to import your own music. I don't know whether the songs loop or not, since I'm playing this on the PlayStation Vita slash TV, so the ability to import songs doesn't work here. The graphics are easily the best thing about Gran Turismo PSP, possibly the best on the system, and that's not surprising given Polyphony's history with other PlayStation consoles. Sure, it might look like something running on Windows 95 on the lowest settings on the TV, but on a portable console in 2009, this is impressive. Like, I can't believe how they were able to pull it off. No slowdown, no texture pop in, 60 frames per second, and as you can see from the replays, they're the same camera angles as GT4. The frame rate was something the developers targeted as soon as they started making this game, because not only does it demonstrate what the PSP was capable of, but in many ways it improves the gameplay, makes control feel smoother. Braking and accelerating are all or nothing since PSP action buttons aren't pressure sensitive. It didn't bother me as much playing it on the Vita, but using a PlayStation 4 control when capturing footage off the PlayStation TV, the steering is very touchy when using the analog stick, especially on the rally stages that require precise movement of all these things. I recommend a combination of analog stick and D-pad control for steering around certain corners. You have standard and professional handling options. Even though Polyphony claimed the physics are based on Gran Turismo 5 Prologue, it might as well say GT3 or GT4 steering options. At least that's what I thought initially. Especially with its chase cam taken from Gran Turismo 3, which massively improves the experience, and opponents actually recognize you on the track. I still maintain if GT4 had these things fixed up the same way they were for Gran Turismo on the PSP, it would be the best in the series. Cars can't be upgraded, but they can be tuned, and at least if you buy one that's suitable for the rally conditions, you don't need to buy tires, just race, you only spend money on buying these vehicles. In a way, it feels like a throwback to the simpler approach to the first three Gran Turismo titles. I know the GT series prides on being as realistic as possible and that professional is the way to play it, but the analog stick is too small for precise movement, the action buttons aren't pressure sensitive, so braking and acceleration is all or nothing no matter what you have it set to, and because it was tended as a launch title for the PSP Go, look at the size and button placement. What does that tell you? So I think the controls being more simplified works best here. It allows the casual players to pick this game up, save some money, build their garage, and every once in a while knock off a few races. But I still think a Gran Turismo mode would have significantly improved the depth. And you're going to be reminded of that every time you finish a race with the random dealership every other day. That's why this review isn't as long as I was expecting. Despite truckloads of content at your disposal, it manages to feel more bare bones than it deserves at the same time. I don't know if it's due to system limitations, or they wanted to try something different for the sake of it because it's portable, or because Polyphony was so busy with other games they rushed certain aspects to meet at least one deadline after countless delays. I really like to know the reason because they have one. But think about this, Gran Turismo PSP was designed to be a portable game, and I think... Okay, this is just my theory. What they intended to do was design it to be enjoyed depending on whatever leisure time you have available. If you only have a five minute trip, you can set a few laps, but like a long plane trip overseas or interstate, you can set it to a double digit range. Basically, you have more control over how long a race takes. It encourages interaction with other players with its sharing trading system and co-op multiplayer linking multiple PSPs together. And importing your garage into Gran Turismo 5, you have to think portability when reviewing games like these. But if I had to choose between less cars with a fully fledged Gran Turismo mode and this, I would pick the former because it's what we love so much about the series. Gran Turismo 2 to the PSP, the exact PS1 game. I don't think I'll ever buy another Vita game ever again because this is all I want to play. In fact, imagine what Polyphony Digital could have done with the PlayStation Vita. Like what if they focused on that instead of Gran Turismo 6? It certainly would have been one of the best selling titles on that system, but knowing how long it takes for them to make video games, as I said before this was originally intended for a 2004 release, it would have been impossible. And the demand for portable games was on the decline anyway. Honestly, they should have just re-released the PS1 titles because they're already established and music isn't as much of an issue compared to most games with licensed soundtracks than you might think. Just use the Japanese soundtrack if you have to. 
but it is Gran Turismo, and when you say a handheld version, you still think lots of cars and tracks, and that's what you get here. If only the social aspect needed to enhance the experience was more readily available. The game is 14 years old at the time of this video, after all. Thanks everyone on Patreon, including Bibbs, Brittleback, Cooper Munn, Darcy McIntosh, David Myers, Emmanuel Figueroa, Eric Barboza, Edmosphere, Indie DM, Mike Camille, Sam Snee, Tick445, and Thomas Rosendale. As well as everyone watching this review, donated to the Beyond Blue fundraiser, and turned up to PAX to meet me, Square Eye Jack, and Mini Me on the Saturday. What a weekend that was. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, follow on Twitch where I stream 3-4 days a week, support on Patreon, join the Discord server, follow on Twitter, Instagram, that's a new one, and Facebook. Book. Thanks again for watching and Spenny out.